Okay, everyone, we're going to to get started. A couple of really quick announcements before we get going. I wanted to just promote next week's seminar. Um, we have Lee Fratness Raps. Um, talking about the um, Deacon Rockfish here in Oregon, um, its ecology and biology, and how it's different from that from um, California. So come for that. Um, I'm also going to put another plug in for the Science on Tap, which is also next Thursday over at the Rogue. Um, it's a little bit more astronomy type stuff, but it should be pretty interesting. Talking about what happens when meteors hit Earth, their impacts both locally and globally. So come join us on that. And as with those short announcements, I um, wanted to introduce today's speaker, who's one of our own. Um, so Sarah Hinkle, which many of you know, uh, is an associate professor, senior researcher at the IB at the um, OSU and works here at Hatfield. Um, she's a benthic ecologist whose research interests uh, address the potential impacts of human activities. So things like wave energy and um, the reserves and coastal development and those kind of things and how those things impact um, bottom dwelling invertebrates and fish. Um, she serves as the associate director at the uh, University Pacific Marine Energy Center and is the director of environmental studies at PacWave, um, which is the uh, energy uh, wave energy facility type stuff that's going on out there. Um, before she moved here, she worked with the California um, Ocean Science Trust, working also with human impacts, invasive species, and those kind of things. A little bit of background on her schooling. Uh, bachelor's from William and Mary, master's from California State, um, PhD from University of California, Santa Barbara. And with that, we can learn a little bit more about crabs. I'll hand it off to thanks, Cinnamon. Thanks for inviting me. Um, Cinnamon saw that I was going to be giving a talk at the um, Canaham Watershed Council last night and was like, as long as you're talking to them, why don't you talk to us the next day? Um, and I didn't actually go up there last night because the woman was like, the roads are going to be really bad and I don't want to worry about you driving. Um, so uh, in two weeks, I'll be speaking at the Watershed Council up in Seaside. So if you have North Coast friends who want to learn about crab tracking, um, you can tell them to come to the Watershed Council meeting. And, um, and you'll be super excited that there's really great turnout for her meeting. OK. so. Um, <laughs> As uh, Cinnamon mentioned, and as you guys may know, um, I work um, in two uh, place-based ecological or fisheries issues, mainly here in Oregon. So offshore renewable energy and marine reserves. And while you wouldn't necessarily think about them within the same sentence, um, I'm going to try to convince you that a lot of the issues around them are parallel. Okay? So what are the fish-relevant issues? And I use fish loosely here. Basically, what are the critter-relevant issues? Um, so we know from this meta-analysis that Sarah Lester did that inside marine reserves um, or other types of protected areas where fishing is restricted, we see increases in density of organisms, uh, in the body size of organisms, and then therefore, of course, total biomass is going to increase if you have bigger, larger organisms. Um, and we also see species density increase. And um, like I said, this was a global meta-analysis um, that was done over 10 years ago now with a lot of data from a lot of different um, marine protected areas around the world. So we're pretty confident um, that there's the potential to see these enhancement effects. Um, but then we think about the fisheries. And so what are the, the issues that are relevant for the fisheries? Um, so the first question is of access. So there's two main questions here. Um, how much fishing area will be lost? Or how much money is going to have to be spent to go around this place where you no longer have access to get to a place where you do? Uh, and so um, you guys probably are familiar, most of you, with the Oregon Marine Reserves process. We now have five marine reserves in place. And ODFNW is conducting a lot of both this ecological and socioeconomic research. Um, and in terms of this last question, there's a, um, an OSU Cascades colleague who's working on um, this pilot effort shifts study. So if those kinds of things interest you, um, I can point you to that resource. Um, but then the other question is, is maybe we'll see enhancement. If we see this increased production inside the marine reserves, um, might that be then spilling over to actually enhance outside areas and sort of mitigate <coughs> that loss of the fishing areas? Uh, and so that can occur two ways. Um, one, just the fish themselves moving. Uh, and so we have some evidence of that, of fish that are tagged inside marine reserves but then move right on out and are available for capture. Uh, and it's going to vary by species how far they move. 
or that increased biomass could increase the fecundity within the marine reserves and then the progeny of those protected fish could spill over. So um, all of these are the same questions we ask when we're thinking about marine renewable energy projects, right? So here we are, we've got some habitat, we've got some structure in the water, some creatures might like it, and we're gonna have restricted access. So what could happen inside that area? Could we get attraction? Could we get production? Could we get spillover? But we expect, of course, that different species are gonna respond differently to these place-based situations or protections. Um, so you might have species that are like highly associated with rocky reef and have really small home ranges. You might have some species that maybe they're not super habitat specific and they've got like, these are their home ranges, <laughs> medium home ranges. Um, or you've got this sandy habitat species um, that has fairly large home ranges. And if we were gonna make some predictions about how they would respond um, to protection, say here, we would think, well, we could see like a pretty large response maybe from the red species because like its whole population stays inside the protected area. But we don't think we're gonna see much of a response from this blue species. And maybe the green is somewhere in between. <coughs> so when we went through the marine reserve process here in the state of Oregon, um, we looked, um, this is data actually come from the marine reserve process in California, but what are the maximum home ranges of the kinds of species we might um, care about here in the Pacific Northwest, um, and how do you think they respond to protection? And so most of the species um, move that we studied had relatively small home ranges. So we would expect like these kinds of species to respond to protection. But this is a talk about crabs. So what about crabs? <laughs> I don't do fish, right? I don't like the creepy crawlies that live on the bottom. So well, we care, we really care about crabs, not just because you're a bunch of ecologists, because they are the highest value of fishery here in Oregon. Um, we land literally tons and tons of them every year. It's a really important part of our coastal community. I just met David here in the front row who moved to Newport because he saw Dungeon Cove and it portrayed it as a wonderful fishing community. And so here he is. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, what do we think about Dungeness and how they'll respond to marine reserves and marine renewable energy sites? So we got to ask, well, how much do they move? Uh, and there's been a lot of studies uh, over decades, in fact, more than half a century of these kinds of studies. Um, and starting up in the north in Alaska, uh, there was a st tagging study done in Fritz Cove. <laughs> Um, using the kinds of acoustic tags that I'm going to talk to you about. And they found that they didn't move very much, like maybe five kilometers or less. Um, and the females that they tagged in the bay didn't even leave the bay. So you'd be like, oh, well, these guys don't move very much. And then you look at this study in British Columbia, and um, they did a number, thousands of these uh, floy tags or spaghetti tags that maybe you're used to just plastic tags, and just a handful of acoustic tags. Um, and they tracked them for 21 to 86 days, which is pretty similar to um, my study that I'm going to tell you about. And they estimated after one year of random dispersal that they would be um, within like 10 to 15 kilometers of, of where they started. Um, so that was in British Columbia. Here in Oregon in 1958, Waldron did a tagging study and found pretty similar results. So average 15 kilometers. Um, but some of them exceeded 92 kilometers, um, so that was a pretty far-ranging crab. Um, also found that those that were um, tagged within bays traveled less than offshore, so that's pretty consistent with Stone and Eau Claire. So we're starting, we're starting to get some consistency amongst the studies in that they're really variable, right? <laughs> um, and then in California, Diamond and Haken only tagged females, um, and they theirs was really interesting. First of all, that they tagged over 11,000 crabs, so that was a pretty significant effort. 59% um, of them had moved less than a kilometer one year later, but what they acknowledged was that these were females, and they're pretty sure that they had gone inshore, like we think females do, hunker down and then exude their eggs, and then ended up back a year later where they had been captured within five kilometers. And so they're like, well, we think they moved a lot, but they're, they're kind of homing back to the same place where they started. Okay, so what about locally? 
Um, so many of you may remember when Ocean Power Technologies was thinking about putting uh, in a project down off Reed's port and there was some question about you know, whether crabs that live in what will be the future wave energy site, are they unavailable for harvest you know, once that goes in. And so um, some Sea Grant people and these private consultants did a similar study to what's been done before, tagged a bunch of crabs, um, released them at these three sites, and then had fishermen tell them where they were. And there was, again, a wide range of distances that they moved, but the average and the maximums, again, were really consistent. So average of 18 kilometers, maximum of 90, which is nearly the same as Waldron half a century earlier. OK, so the only thing we know is that they moved some or a lot. <laughs> um, but we could be pretty sure that if we had to characterize them as one of these species, they're probably a blue species, right? They live in sandy habitat. They've got pretty large home ranges. We don't expect them to be um, necessarily protected by a marine reserve. Or if instead of a marine reserve, we have a wave energy park, they're just going to come in and out. Um, so what we would say is that we would expect the local effect to be small for a species with this high mobility. And the local effect in marine reserve literature just means there's more inside the protected area than outside. So why do they move so much? Well, I think they're really hungry. So this is actually a video from Stephanie's thesis uh, of crabs who they want this bait so badly. I mean, this is like a really incredibly high surge day. And this bait is in a pot, in a little pot that they can't get. And they are still so tenacious. <laughs> really want that bait. And we know that the fishery is really successful. So we, we're pretty sure they're really highly attracted to bait. Let's just go ahead and click the next slide. OK. So um, there's some evidence in the literature for this. So Holmesman et al., um, they modeled subadult crabs in Willapa Bay and determined that their energetic demand of the subadults, or how much they needed to consume, exceeded the estimated annual subtitle prey production. So these are three different parts of the bay. Um, this one is the lower side channels where they found most of the crabs. And these little lines here are the, um, the production levels of what they consider their prey to be. And so. Over the years, um, which in this model, they didn't model fluctuations in the prey. They only modeled fluctuations in the po um, population of the crabs. But basically, <coughs> there was always more demand than there was subtitle prey. Uh, and so this is uh, kind of the study that made us think that they're going to have to do intertidal foraging in the estuaries to meet their energetic demands. In fact, what Holmesman modeled was that um, in these lower side channels, where two thirds of the crabs congregate, they could deplete the subtitle prey biomass in 17 simulation days. They could eat it all. Um, so the benthic productivity in their preferred habitat does not appear to be sufficient to meet the energetic demands of the population. So what about out on the shelf? So as you guys know, because I've come and talked to you often, I've been out on the shelf a lot. I've stabbed the bottom over a thousand times, <laughs> and trawled it quite a few times. Um, and so I've got a pretty good idea of what's out there. And to be honest, it's not much. Um, definitely less than is in the estuary. So I've had students that have um, bombed a lot of the things we've collected. And so if you look at um, the standing stock estimates um, of these same prey categories that Holmesman used in her um, model, we've got less energetic density on the shelf than in the estuary and subtitle, which you guys can imagine um, amphipods out on the shelf are like this big, right? And in the estuary, you've got like Eupagebia and Eutropea, like humongous, delicious mud shrimp. And so you can see a big difference here in the crustacean that's on the shelf versus in the bay. Um, so how do our um, crab densities compare? Well, unfortunately, Dave Sampson retired before we got a stock assessment of crabs. <laughs> So we don't exactly know how many are out there. <laughs> um, but if we look, um, so Holmesman estimated that there were about 15 kilograms of the crabs that she modeled per hectare. And if we look at our landings data, if you just look at the adult legal males, um, we've got about 13 kilograms per hectare of adult legal males. Um, and so we have way more than that of total crabs. 
So it definitely seems like um, they might be food limited on the shelf. Of course, the alternative explanation for this is that this low standing stock is just because there are so many of them and they've eaten it all down. And so um, the next step is to uh, estimate benthic production, not just the standing stock. Um, so in Holmesman's model, she used published values for production to biomass ratios, but most of those were developed using estuarine organisms, which we know are really different. Um, so one of the things that um, is happening in my lab is undergraduates get to measure little tiny bivalves and, <laughs> and crustaceans and see how they grow. So we'll be um, getting these production to biomass estimates, and then we can run a model that's similar um, to Holzman. Um, the other thing that we haven't considered yet, um, one is cannibalism. So how much is that contributing to the crabs? And the other is bait. So we know that literally tons of bait gets thrown onto the seafloor every crab season. And so that's something that um, is probably a major food source for the crabs, at least seasonally. Uh, and so my gr new graduate student, whom some of you have met, um, she is conducting gut content and stable isotope analysis to try to um, quantify those different contributions to um, the crab's tissue. So back to them moving, because that's really why you guys are all here, not to find out what I'm going to talk about in two years when Toby's graduated. So in terms of their movement, they move a lot probably because they're constantly foraging. So I thought, you know, what if they lived near a richer food source? So we know the ones out on the shelf that most of the studies have been done on move a lot. Um, so like what if dungeness that live near a rat natural reef where we have like high productivity, litter fall, they can go forage around the reef, will they move less than those in the open sand habitat? Um, presumably because they'll have more local foraging success. And so this is where I phone a friend. And I'm like, hey Curtis, <laughs> Curtis Rogner from NOAA, you've been doing these crab movement studies off the mouth of the Columbia River for years. You've been looking at um, the dredge material disposal and the effects on crabs. Um, so he's got some disposal areas, but also some reference areas. And so it's like, well, he's got some like, you know, control areas. Can we use those and compare them to a rocky reef area and see how much the crabs move in this rocky reef area versus your reference areas that are in the open sand habitat? Um, and we picked, of course, um, Cape Falcon because that's the one that's closest to the mouth of the Columbia River where um, these ongoing studies that Curtis has been doing. So, so um, all right, so now we've got an idea, we've got a site picked out, we've got a method picked out. Um, so what's left? Money, we need some money. <laughs> so we gotta find some funding and maybe some more collaborators. Um, so right about this time is when the Edder family made a generous donation to the Marine Studies Initiative to fund work on Dungeness. Uh, and so thank you, Bob and Michelle, if you're listening online. Um, and so part of that um, call really heavily favored um, collaboration. So we've already got a, an OSU researcher and I've got my NOAA friend on board. Um, and so we needed to find a collaborative fisherman. So Bob Browning of the Lady Bee out of Garibaldi um, was willing to support us for this project. And then because I was gonna do it in a marine reserve, of course I called ODF and W, like, hey. <laughs> uh, so there we are, um, all of our collaborators out on the boat. Um, so the way we carried out this work um, was we got some really expensive sensors. Uh, so we've got um, these Vemco receivers that listen for acoustic tags. Um, and then we've got Lindsay with her oxygen sensor that was very expensive. And she's like kind of worried about um, what we're going to do with it. Um, <laughs> because we're going to throw it in the ocean. Um, and that, that little circle was there to remind me to talk to you guys about anchors. So um, these are the anchors that I use. They're humongous links of old anchor chain. Um, and so for this project, I had 16 receivers. So I should have had 16 anchors. And I went out to the shipyard a couple days before to get ready to load them on the pallets and drive them to Garibaldi. And there were 12. Uh, so that was disappointing. I called up Curtis and I'm like, hey, do you have four extra anchors? Do you have four hunks of metal that we can use? And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, and so he showed, he showed up with like anchor chain that had links like this big. I was like, no, no. 
Like, you know, this might work maybe like at the mouth of the Columbia River, but this is going to be kind of wild out here. Um, so you'll see the consequences of that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we like those big honking anchors because we are throwing this stuff in the ocean. Um, so then, of course, we have to get our study subjects, the crabs, um, and then we attach really expensive things to them. Uh, and so we use these um, Vemco electronic tags, and they ping. Um, and what we did for this study is we set them at a really high ping <coughs> rate so we could hear from them as frequently as possible, and also because the crabs were going to molt in six months and walk right out of them and leave them behind, so there wasn't really point in making the battery last much longer. Um, so then we throw them in the ocean, but we don't really throw them. We like nicely, gently lower them into the ocean. Um, so there's um, Logan Browning, Bob Browning's son, doing some science there. Um, and then we listen for the crabs. Uh, and so after we glued all these tags to the crabs and put them in the ocean, uh, we've got this mobile receiver. Um, and this is kind of like, you know, the moment of truth. Like, OK, are they in there? And so was, this is an actual picture. We're sitting on the deck. We're like, yep, I heard from that one. I, I heard from that one. Um, so there's all of our crabs and their sex and their size. And OK, we heard from all of them. So then what happens is you just, you just leave. Right? You threw your sensors in the ocean, you threw your crabs in the ocean, and you just wait. And then you like constantly check the forecast and you get forecasts like hurricane force wind warning. And you're just like, okay, right? And so um, so I had really um, really wanted to get back up to Cape Falcon um, before crab season started, before winter weather started. Um, so I could at least download the data from all the receivers and then throw them back in the ocean to continue monitoring, but at least if they were lost, I'd have the data from those two months. Well, when you work with people that you don't pay, they don't necessarily are not necessarily as committed. Um, so there was, a, there was one day in November that Bob was available to take me out, and it happened to be the, the one day that I was like, I can't just drop everything and drive up to Garibaldi today. So um, it was a very, very stressful couple months. Um, and then uh, on December 21st, I got a phone call from some guy named Phil. And he's like, hey, I found your thing. Um, <laughs> you know, what is it? <laughs> what, are, what, what do I do with it? Do you want it? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, can you take it to the port office in Garibaldi? Because we had informed them about the project. Um, and he was like, well, no. He's like, how about if I take it to the Cannon Beach Police Station? And I was like, that sounds good. Like, the police, police will hold on to it. And so that's like the 21st of December. It's right before Christmas break. And I'm like, okay, the police will hang on to it sometime over break. I'll drive up there. And then apparently a lot of people do Christmas beach walks on the North Coast because Christmas Eve, I got a voicemail. Um, I found this thing. What do I do with it? Um, and then Christmas Day, this washed up on my beach with these pictures attached. Um, so the thing is, like, the, the North Coast beach washing, walking community are awesome. They're out there, um, and they're keeping their eyes out. So that was my first um, law enforcement encounter. So then I'm like, OK, it's, it's Christmas break. Um, I've got all this research gear up at the Kennedy Beach Police Department. Um, and school's not in session, so I've got my kid with me. So let's do some youth engagement in science. And so I was like, if you come to the police station with me to get science gear, we'll stop at the cheese factory and you can get ice cream. <laughs> okay, so so they me and my six-year-old were driving up to the police station, and then on the way back, um, I made her stop at the beach to see if any more had washed up, um, because the three that I that had washed up were those ones on the not so heavy anchors, and so I was like, ah, oh, there's one more out there, so. I'm like making her walk the beach, look <laughs> for my washed up science gear. Um, <clears throat> so we didn't we didn't find it. So where is the fourth one from the, these gates is what I call them. Um, <clears throat> so it showed up uh, January 21st. Some guy named Doug found it. Uh, and I was like, OK, um, that's cool. You, you're at Crescent Beach. Um, can you take it 
for the Cannon Beach Police Station. Now they know who I am. They know what this stuff is, right? And he's like, no, I already drove back to Portland. Um, I'll take it to the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. <laughs> OK, so now the sheriff knows who it is. Um, so I didn't have to drive up to Portland. Uh, Miguel from the Sheriff's Office got it all boxed up and shipped it back to me. So OK, so now we got the, the local PD. We got the Sheriff's <laughs> Office involved. Um, so, but I'm like, okay, those are my four ones that were on Light Anchors. Everything's good now. Nope. Everything is not good. I really should have named this talk like tracking receivers also, in addition to crabs. So then a um, couple days later, I get this email um, from John Weldon, and he walks the beach on Long in Long Beach, Washington. And <laughs> he had one for me. Um, and so I think this one, someone, it was one of the ones from the heavy anchor. They must have cut the line. Uh, Someone moving, this happens on my offshore one, moving through, gets a cotton air prop, cut the line, and, and off it goes. So that I was like, that is amazing. Like, okay. So he shipped it back to me. And then it just got weirder from there. So then my phone rings, and it's Forrest. And Forrest is like, hey, I got one of your things inside one of my crab pots. And I was like, no, no, you didn't. And he's like, oh, yes, I did. <laughs> so one of the receivers had somehow completely come off of its mooring. I think it had to have been cut. And Forrest is telling me it's inside his crab pot. And so I didn't, I, I was like, this seems impossible. But I took my receiver and I went to my crab pots. And it, co it could go in. It does fit. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> he used things that some motion physics made it get in there. It seems like maybe someone was messing with him, but whatever. He found it inside his crab pot. Um, and so he's like, he's like, all right, I'm going to take it to the Warrington Police Department. So, <laughs> so now, now Warrington Police Department is involved. So this, the, the outreach and engagement in this project with the local community, with youth, with law enforcement has just been absolutely fantastic. Uh, so it's, it's everything that we would want a collaborative project to be. We've got the fishermen. We've got the fishermen's kids. Okay, so finally, finally it's retrieval day. Finally it's April and Bob and I find a date we can go out together. So I threw 16 of them in the ocean. 16 of them have, or six of them have washed up. That means there might be, I might be finding 10. I might find 10. So how many are we going to find? Well, so first of all, I have zero pictures from that day because the whole time we're just like looking for buoys, for floats, right? Like there's not anything else going on. And this had to actually be one of, one of my most satisfying days of my career because the day we went out, it was Curtis and his colleague Brian and Lindsay and I, and we kind of all went out together and looked super legit. And then the day that I went to pick him up, it was just me on the boat with Bob and his son. And Bob was like, there is no way your stuff is still here. There's no way. I was like, well, you know, like, I've done this before, <laughs> thrown these things in the ocean a lot of times. I usually get most of them back. And he's like, no. So and it's just me. And I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen. So finally, like we're we're like leaving Gar Fort Garibaldi and we're going up there and we head to the very first station and coming up on it, I'm like, there it is. And Bob's like, no way. I was like, there it is. And he gets up, he's like, it's right where you left it. And I was like, that was my plan. Like, yes, it was right. <laughs> um, so anyway, they weren't all where I left, and we ended up only getting six back from the 10 that were still there. So it was it was a pretty rough deployment, um, all things considered. But still, um, we had data from 12 of them. So what did we detect? So if any of you guys have not done this kind of research before, this has to be actually like one of the most satisfying <coughs> kinds of oceanographic deployment to do. Because usually you pull an instrument back, you take it to the lab, you have to download it. There's all this data processing, right? If you've ever downloaded CTV data, these things are like, boom, there's your fish or crap or whatever it is. So you just like download the data and it pops up on the screen. And these, each of one of these rows is one of my receivers. And each one of these dots are my crabs. And so each different color dot is a different crab. So like you're like, boom, there they are. So this was um, the day we deployed it. This is a, just a three hour window. And you can see like all the crabs are on all the receivers. They're just like moving around right there in the reef. And then um, this is now uh, 10 days later. So this is October 10th. 
and these are the receivers that are um, near the reef, and then these are our distant, we have distant receivers to see like there's this main detection area, and then there's um, further away. And you can see like um, this red crab, this is our um, north gate, so that crab has left the reef and is at the north end of the marine reserve, so we can see it moved up there. And then this purple crab, and it's, um, so there's these two south gates, this purple crab has moved down and is at the southern boundary of the marine reserve. So these are just awesome, it's an awesome tool and awesome data to get because like immediately you can see where the crab was without all this post-processing. Okay, so overall, um, we did detect all of the 20 dungeon nests that we released in the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. There's an asterisk on there because we think after about a week, the tag fell off one of the crabs because the tag stopped moving. So either the crab was dead or the tag fell off, probably the tag fell off. Um, and um, 19 of the dungeon nests that we were released at our comparison area. So um, pretty good. Um, some other exciting things. Um, we picked up 35 green sturgeon in the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Um, we know that because uh, this technology can pick up any tag that's made by this manufacturer. Um, 25 of those also moved through the North Head comparison area. So um, pretty near shore of green sturgeon. And then the thing that gets people excited, I don't know why, were these tags right here, which were this guy. Uh, or seven of these guys, right? Everyone, I give this talk and all anyone cares about are these seven tags. These, <laughs> so there were seven tags that belonged to great white sharks. Um, you can see uh, my deployment was October through April. We saw a couple hits. So this is this shark hit the receiver eight times in November. Um, but then we had this pair of sharks that must have spent some time together because they got sequential tags. So when they were captured, they, whoever was capturing them probably was like, boom, boom. Um, they really, they seem to just hang out um, in the marine reserve. So I, I downloaded these data and then I was like, Lindsay, did you say that you guys were going to go diving? I have a cake fountain next week. So just so you know, <laughs> this is who's there. Okay, so. Um, Back to the crabs. So how did the habitats compare? Um, well, there's a couple things about this plot that I think are really striking. So um, when uh, we did the deployments at the um, North Head comparison area, instead of doing all 20 at once, we did 10, and then a week later we did 10. Um, and so that's the blue and the green numbers here. And they're very similar. So um, most of them left the area in less than a day. In each of the deployments, one of them stayed one to two days, and in each of the deployments, one of them stayed seven days. Like one was 6.9 days and one was 7.3 days. So I thought that was remarkable how similar those two deployments were. And then what you can see is that the Cape Falcon crabs in the reef area were really quite different. Um, some of them did stay a short period of time, but then these bins get larger. So that's every day, and then this is two to three weeks, three weeks to a month, a month to two months, and then longer than two months. So we had a number of crabs that stayed in there for months at a time. So on average, the crabs released at the North Head Array stayed um, for 1.2 days, the largest being, longest being 7.4, whereas the crabs released in the Cape Falcon in the reefy area stayed on average 12 days, ranging all the way up to 73 days. Um, so even with a lot of variability, that's statistically significant. Um, so just a little bit more detail. When the North Head crabs left the array, um, four, six of them were detected at gate receivers. And I realized I failed to tell you what gates are. So if we've got our main array, then we have what we call these gates north and south of there just to see when they get further away. Um, and again, what was remarkable was the consistency. So when we, the two different releases that were a week apart, in both cases, two went north and one went south. <laughs> so again, pretty consistent. Um, here we get our long range um, information that's more similar to those studies I stated before. So one was collected by a fisherman at the mouth of Willapa Bay um, after 113 days. And that's a straight line distance of 31 kilometers. So if the crab is just <coughs> trekked straight there. Um, 
And then in this case, um, one crab seemed to exhibit this sort of homing behavior where it left and then it came back and then it left and it came back again. So a little bit of that um, homing behavior that uh, Diamond and Ring Hinken thought might be the case earlier. Okay, so then the Cape Falcon crabs. So um, eight of the Cape Falcon crabs were subsequently detected at the gate receivers, um, but they were really variable in the, their behavior in that case. Um, two of them went south, one of them went immediately south, so two days after releasing it in the reef, it was there. The other one took 52 days to get there. So she was just, it was a female, she was like, doo doo doo, like hung out in the array for a while, went south. Um, but they didn't necessarily leave for good. And so what we can see um, here is that this green crab um, was up here. These are the ones, like before, that were in the reef. So she's at one of these array nodes. And then she came down here to the south gate. And then, poop, she ended up back in the array. And she just like hung back out in the reef again. She's like, I like the reef. Um, and so um, these are the, the two. Um, so it took her 50. She was in the main detection area for almost a month. Two months later, showed up down at the south gate. Didn't stay there long. And then she went on what I call a walkabout, where I don't know where she was for another month. And then she came back to the reef for another week. Um, so definitely seemed to exhibit this high residency. Um, and then of those eight, um, six of them traveled north. Um, and uh, four of them were males, and two of them were females. They're not as interesting. Um, <clears throat> three of them um, went north and were subsequently caught by fishermen. Um, and so this one crab, crab number eight, he was released here in Cape Falcon on the, in October. On the 20th of January, he was found in 75 fathoms depth on the north side of Astoria Canyon, which is 70 kilometers away. That fisherman called it in and dropped that legal mail back in the ocean. He didn't have to do that, but he did. And a different fisherman caught that same crab inside Grays Harbor, which is another 75 kilometers away. So in March. So this crab, like, seriously got around. Um, so, uh, basically what can we learn from this? Well, um, what we knew before, some of them don't go far, some of them do. <laughs> um, but, uh, if we compare the habitats, we can talk about the crabs in the open sand, they stayed for about a day on average, they all left within a week, one returned to a ray, um, Two were collected by fishermen. The maximum distance recorded was 30 kilometer, 31 kilometers, whereas the crabs in the Rocky Reef habitat stayed in the, for, on average, 12 days. Um, some stayed one to two months. As in the other habitat, just one left and came back. Um, in this case, three of them were collected by fishermen. So it seems that habitat does influence crab movement. Um, so while we normally think of them as this blue species that are wide-ranging with large home ranges in a sandy habitat, maybe if they find a reef, they kind of act like a green species. They're like, hey, this is a pretty good place. Like, maybe I'll kind of hang out here, forage on the reef a little bit, um, not go so far. Of course, this project was funded by the Etter Family Foundation, and I had um, Bob Etter in my office at some point after I was doing this project, and he was like, oh yeah, I mean, you're totally right, because we know like there's these crabs that have really smooth bellies, and they're like the movers, and they're the ones we want, and then there's crabs with mossy bellies. Those are the ones that just like hang out near the reef, and they don't move very much, and so that's why their bellies get all mossy. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, this is where like we should have gotten a little bit more traditional ecological like knowledge research. Um, I really wish I'd known this like before because like I think a super interesting thing to do would have been to like make on my little sheet like a column like mossy belly, clean belly, right? Like that, <laughs> I mean, that could have explained like all the variability in my data. Um, so anyway, it was a it was a very satisfying conversation um, that all this money and expensive electronics sort of confirmed this traditional ecological knowledge uh, that the fishermen had. Uh, 
So that was good. Um, but one thing I do want to um, say explicitly, because as I've talked to community members about this, I think there's been a little bit of confusion, is none of what I was looking at or reporting on is necessarily a, an MPA effect, right? Like I was not looking at the effect of protection. I was just using this protected area as a great study site um, where I thought that my gear would be less interacting <laughs> with the fishing community and have higher survival rate. Um, so I just want to make sure that I get that out there. Um, but so when we think about the marine reserves, um, maybe they'll protect crabs more than we thought they were. So like if crabs go in there, they find a nice foraging area, maybe they'll hang out in there a little bit more. Um, similarly, if wind or wave projects eventually function as um, artificial reefs after they've been there a while and they get colonized, maybe they'll become attractive to crabs that'll go in there um, and be less accessible for fishermen. In both cases, bait can totally attract them out. Um, when I was calling Garibaldi fishermen looking for a collaborator, <clears throat> some guy was like, yeah, well, I mean, I don't think you need to do your study because I know they're in the marine reserves because if I just stick my crab pots at the southern boundary of the marine reserves, I can draw them all out and into my pots. Um, <laughs> so he's like, absolutely, they hang out in there, but I can still get them. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but so the good thing is, is that like maybe though, if these reef crabs that go into these areas that have greater foraging opportunities and have a little bit of protection, um, maybe that could lead to reproduct increased reproductive capacity that could spill over and seed um, these outside areas. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank all of the collaborators who tracked crabs and my collaborators who tracked uh, receivers <laughs> all on the North Coast beaches. Um, the, of course, the Edder family for the funding, um, Curtis and Brian from NOAA for support with the project and field work, um, all of the ODF and W collaborators who um, have got given me gear or given me crabs, um, really thoughtful conversations with John Chapman about prey energetics, um, people from OSU and MSI, of course, then um, all the community members uh, and the fishermen uh, who helped. And then I see Jason's in the back there who built all the moorings. So um, with that, I'll take questions. Are there more crabs in the reserves? Are they a higher density? It'd be really tough to know um, because they're so attracted to bait, you could, it, you could put pots in there and attract them in. So you'd have to do something like trawling, but trawling is not really something we want to do in a marine reserve. Um, so, so you don't know even right now whether that long period of stay results in more crabs piling up there. And if it's not a higher density, something else is happening. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I don't know if more of them are in there or if just the ones that are in there are Hey, that's just really mean, and they beat up all. They're like, this, the is, this is my reef <laughs> and <laughs> foraging here. But that's, I mean, that is, that's really what we want to know, right? And it's what we want to know um, about wave energy projects. Like, are they going to attract crabs and keep them in there? Um, and that's like we were talking about the local effect. Like, we don't expect there to be a local effect, which is the density is higher inside than outside. Um, but these new findings about maybe longer residents, maybe they could start accumulating. And that's something that's worth following up on. Me. So um, a lot of your movement results in your crowds remind me of all of our cetacean data, <laughs> where there's a lot of different individuals doing different things, and it's hard to figure out what any of it means. But oftentimes, we, when you dig deeper into the data and you try to start relating it to demographic unit and environmental conditions or habitat, you can start to see the trends and why individuals are doing certain things, going mm -hmm. roaming farther, and so forth. So I was just wondering if you have built up a good enough, deep, rich enough data set to mine it like that, and try to look at some of those patterns within your data. Not yet. Um, these were just the 20 crabs in the marine reserve. Um, <clears throat> we did put um, what Lindsay was <laughs> the oxygen and the temperature and the salinity sensors in there. Um, and there was actually, this is my like back pocket slide. <laughs> D 
didn't plant me to ask this. Um. <laughs> but there's the, temper the oxygen and temperature data. <clears throat> um, and um, you can see that like right after we put it in, there's this is the DO on the y-axis. There was a pretty low DO event. Um, and so, you know, did, did that make a bunch of them leave? You know, unless we had DO sensors elsewhere where the crabs ended up, it'd be hard to know, you know, if they were trying to escape that event or not. Um, but, I mean, this is definitely research that we're really interested in continuing to try to figure that out. From the sensors that broke free, like, how did you get, you know, tease that apart? You said, what did they just instantaneously break free and then you knew you assumed they were in the original position or did they have some sort of navigational? So we have, um, we have a sentinel tag that is, we've sent it to the bottom with an anchor and so the sensors can hear that sentinel tag and so when the sentinel tag isn't showing up on the sensor data then we're like okay the sensor like left. Um, also the first three that washed up on the 21st, the 24th, and the 25th we cannot be pretty sure it was probably an event that was pretty close to right before then that made them all leave. <coughs> But yeah, no, they don't. They don't turn off. So they're detecting, and I mean, it's possible that like while they're dragging along the ocean or in forest crab pot, they're <laughs> still detecting things that are swimming up above. Um, but we try to use ways to figure out. Yeah. I was just thinking about the moss here between <coughs> belly crabs, and I was wondering where, what, like sandy versus reef locations, did you set your traps to catch? So in the um, Cape Falcon Marine Reserve, we were inside the reserve but outside the reef just because we didn't even put the pots in the reef. So, so they, the Cape Falcon crabs were crabs that could have been attracted off the reef into our pots or attracted from outside the reserve into our pots. It's, you know, tough to say where they came from. Um, and so maybe that's, you know, the difference between the ones that stayed, you know, less than a week and the ones that stayed three months. I mean, I really wish, I wish I'd just like known about the mossy bellies and had a column in my data sheet for that. <laughs> yeah. For the Cape Falcon receivers, uh, those were about 10 or so? Um, we had, what we had was, uh, I didn't, I went through this so quickly, I didn't explain that um, configuration. So, so in both cases what we had was we had 16 um, that were really in our focus area where we wanted to make sure we didn't miss any crabs and so at Cape Falcon they were, you can see these are the rocks in the bathymetry. Um, and then over here the same, and then we have what we refer to as the gates, which are these receivers that are far away, either, and these are on the southern boundary and the northern boundary of the marine reserve. So potentially within Cape Falcon, you have the high density, mm -hmm. we construct fine scale movements as they are detected as different receivers. Um, so you understand you can send them at two, either the, uh, two sensors at the same time, right? Well, so yes, if you have, so if they need to be on three receivers, but they need to be the kinds of receivers that also have tags on them so that the receivers can hear each other. And those are not the kinds of receivers I had for this project. So for um, theoretically, yes. This time, no. In the future, I'd love to. Um, actually, <laughs> like, you know, make those super awesome movies of, you know, exactly where the crabs are. Um, Curtis's receivers that he put off the North Head site are the more expensive ones that can detect each other. And but his movies are really boring because like he puts the crabs in, then and then that's the end of the movie. Like because they leave in a day and they don't go. <laughs> so um, thought about showing it and I was like, well, that's not that exciting. Um, so it'd be great too. Yeah. So the uh, Sandy site mm -hmm. that you were working on is that a site of a soil which could be low invertebrate? Um, this was this is Curtis's reference 
area to the dredge spoil site. Because they have typical. Yes, the idea is that it's typical. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea about like, the quality of those sites? It's going to be like 10 fixed positions, but are the crabs moving through them with like a higher quality or worse quality site within the reef and the sand? Um, that would be tough. So if I had the kind of um, positioning system kinds of receivers where we could track them, that's something we could look into. Um, in terms of quality within the reef. Yeah, like why do some of them leave and some of them stay? Some of them there for a week and some of them are there for 60 days, right? Right. Um, so that could have been, again, maybe they're like the highly migratory kinds of crabs that I happen to catch by attracting them in versus the ones that have lived in that reef for a while and they're kind of like these reef crabs that like to hang around. Um, or, you know, something attracted them. They smelled, some of them smelled something and just went off in search of it. Uh, this is definitely the first um, of what could be a whole other set of research because um, yeah, there's way more questions than there are answers. Uh, I know your sample size was small, so there, you might not have been able to detect much uh, difference, but getting back to some of the demographic stuff, was there any noticeable difference between how males and females typically um, moved out or how long? The, the females did, the ones that stayed longer were the females. Um, so most <coughs> of those ones at the far side of the histogram were the females. It was, the females were the ones that like left and came back. Um, but, um, for the north head crabs, which were half females and half males, the one that left and came back twice was a male. So, <laughs> um, what was interesting is all of the ones that went, so no males went south. So, of the ones that we could detect that they hit those gate receivers, males only went north, whereas females went north or south. But again, small sample size, so whether that means anything. There. All the receivers went north. <laughs> so definitely the prevailing current is to the north. Do you have any photos of your, your crab that you um, I do. Um, Anything that would reveal? No, only the, only the backs of them as we were gluing things on them. <laughs> and, where am I? Um, and we did, one thing that um, we did pick crabs that looked like they were in good condition to us, which to us meant like clean and not like a bunch of barnacles on them. Yeah, there is one upside down one. Um, and so, you know, a highly migratory crab might be cleaner, and whereas like kind of a slower moving mossy could have also accumulated barnacles. So we might have unduly influenced it by picking like those, what, what we thought were good condition crabs. So most of the marine reserves have been centered around reef areas here in Oregon. So has yeah. there been any like work on whether protecting the reef preferring individuals could alter the composition of the larger population? So I think in 2023 we're gonna find out when ODFW releases their report. <laughs> They've been monitoring for years and doing data synthesis, um, so we'll all just be looking forward to hearing about that. So for the crab that ended up in Grace Harbor, do you think that was just occurring? Well, the other thing that, um, so this the working with Curtis and, and Stephanie's thesis up there, we've got, um, we've used a lot of video tools too. Um, and one thing that we've learned is like when crabs move, they're not like the, the, the way we see them move on land where they look awkward and walking sideways is when they decide they want to go, they like stand up and put the, like, their claws up and their swim rods down and then they can get in the current and they just like, zoop, they go really fast. And so they ride those currents, but they ride them on purpose, we think. Um, so what they, 
I don't think it was an accident and ended up in Grace Harbor. I mean, to some extent it was, but it might have ridden the current up there and then been like, oh, estuary. Estuaries are really, like, I like estuaries. A lot of our crabs like to go in the estuary, right? It's a lot more food in there. So he went in and then he got caught for the second, well, third time, because I caught him. And then <laughs> the fisherman caught him and then the second fisherman caught him. So he's highly attracted to bait, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, we, would, we would have loved to have done the whole marine reserve and the whole border so that none of them could escape without us knowing. Um, but, you know, we are definitely limited by funds. Um, there is an, uh, a, a plan for a like, really, really um, comprehensive VEMCO array to go in off the Olympic coast, off Washington, um, mostly to study salmon and other, like, fish. But um, I'm super interested in starting a project up there that's like, as long as you're going to have this like humongous array up there, let's tag some crabs and throw them in and let's see where they go. Um, so, yeah. So I was interested about your project using table isotopes to look at what they're eating because I think probably that's linked with their movement patterns, mm -hmm. right? Probably more variable stable isotopes. But, so going back to your tagging and movement studies, can you sample them before you tag them and then do stable isotope on that, or do you have to kill them to sample them? Well, you need tissue. I mean, you could you could take like hemolymph. You could what? The the hemolymph, like the fluid. Yeah. But, okay. So, you could, so we I could. Think that might be interesting if you could then link their variability in movement with their stable <coughs> isotope signature. That's really yeah. You could take a leg off. You could take a leg off. That might affect their movement. <laughs> 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 Give some control, right? <laughs> if I got caught and a leg was off, I'd probably hunker down for a little bit. But no, yeah, you, yes. <laughs> maybe maybe just sucking a little human leaf out might be <laughs> first round. Yeah, great idea. Lee. What's the transmission range of the Um so we Estimate like 400 meters um, in that habitat. Um, it seems like it's further because uh, like some of those crabs I could pick up on the whole interior way, but you know we set those distances so in the worst case scenario conditions it's when it's windy and waves are crashing against the rocks. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming.